comprehensive artwork, um, influential, so, and, it, and you've, you've just mentioned that design, typography, industrial design, interior design. So that was all the things that were there. And if you look at this course, oh, and while he was there, he that was in one of these first things he did at the Bauhaus, which was called the League of Nations, because that had just been founded in 1919. And, and I don't know if, if the embryo re, re, represents the birth of the, the um, League of Nations or not. But um, yes, and his, this theme about people holding hands never left him. You'll, you'll see plenty of examples of that. You can see them at, at Geelong Grammar as well, right? So, and one of the things he did at the Bowl House as well, he um, uh, he'd started the, the colour light plays. And th this is him with the apparatus. He's, he's actually still famous for this today, for the colour light plays. And they're complete, it's completely different. So this is the back of the play of the... Thing. And the, the screen where the, where the light was transmitted is at the front. And these are all the lamps. And the lamps that are used and moved around. And they've also got shutters on them so that you have, the, you have an intense light and a less, less light. And what happens is he's developed what, what could be described as moving art. So this is just an example of one shot of this moving art. And so... And so these shapes were at the front and they came onto a transparent screen. And when they were on the trans transparent screen, um, they seemed to double the size. So the more lamps he added, the more size, uh, colour, uh, more uh, different shade types of things came up upon, upon it. It, um, it multiplied. So as you can see... So that was, and, and he mixed the colours. So he had a great um, knowledge of the colours. So these are some more. You can see the, the, the light box at the front was, inside it was all black. And as I said, this was what was transparent that came through the front of the light box, right? So there's more examples of that. And he even wrote the music to go with it. So... And so this was, um, the music went with that as well. So you had the, the music that he wrote and so then he had um, with it was uh, like a score in, in, in the orchestra that, that there was a movement for each, to each bar of the music. So it all, all the movements of, the, of these um, shapes took place with the music. So you did that as well. But anyway, the, the time at the um, Bauhaus uh, finished because Germany had, you know, had lost the war and they had to pay back all this, this money to, to, you know, for reparation. And they did this by, they decided to go and print money. So they, and of course, the money became useless. So you can see this, I just found this on the internet, somebody burning the money using it instead of wood using money because they printed so much. So that so and once you got the bad time in, in, in Germany, you started to get um, the right wing government started to 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 flourish, right? And so the Bauhaus was 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 closed. Anyway, the Bauhaus uh, they found uh, as so I've said that as the so the, the Bauhaus was a very liberal institution, right? And so a new they found a new location in another state of Germany, in, in Dessau. They found a man who was quite willing. And, and, but Ludwig decided to concentrate on colour light plays. And he even performed with some famous uh, filmmakers of the time, in 1923 it was, um, and he was the only one where he didn't have a film. He had that, his, his colour light plays. So, so he was the only one without the film. He also worked with this um, Albert Talhoff, who was interested in theatre lighting. He put on a, a huge play 
and uh, he asked him to help with the with the um, with the lighting and everything. Anyway, he, he, he did that for a while. Then he went to. Uh, this was the beginning of his teaching career. So far, he'd been a student and, and worked on this, and he he obtained work at this again a very modern school, a co-educational school, which you don't have much, didn't have much in Germany, and it it was also very much an outdoor where they did a lot of outdoor activities. And it was called the Free School Community. And it was in Bickelstock, which is way up in the, in the mountains, right? And it was based on the, so he, he mixed with educational reformers, right? So, and um, he, he started a course that his, um, his friend Albert, uh, Josef Albers had developed. And you can see he says here on that balance and square using wood dowlings and wood blocks. So they, he did a lot of that work. So there's some of the students with him. And I think he's sitting down, he's the one down, down the bottom there, and, and that's his, uh, his students. And he also designed uh, furniture. That was part of it. He did that at Bickerstock as well. And again... He done this or had done this already in in Weimar, where they did a huge kite back. They made kites, they had uh, kites, and they also had land parades. So he continued that tradition in in um, in Bickerstorf. and you can see the children are all, they had to design their own lanterns and everything. So he made all those. So there there he is with the with the children, and you can see. It, they're in Bickerstorf, definitely, because it's, it's really high up in the mountains, in the Turinga Forest, with the with the you can see the, the trees in the back, the fir tree. Anyway, um, he then got a position at, at another school. When Bickerstorf fin finished, he got a, 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 a position at another school. But while he was at um, at the um, Weimar Bauhaus. He had, uh, there was a, so people wanted to learn a bit more about color theory, and Eaton didn't want to, did, who could have done it didn't want to do it. Claire didn't want to do it, so he decided he would do it. And in the preparation, he made uh, at least forty or so color charts, different color charts, and they they did various experiments. And even the two masters, Claire and Kandinsky came as well. And part of that they did, they decided, they sent out these um, these three colours, the, the triangle, the square and the, and, and the circle, and they had, people had to put a colour to it. And the overwhelming response from the people was yellow in, in, in the triangle, Red in the square and blue in in the in the circle. So, and this 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 actually this chart is at um, the Harvard Museum in 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 New York. No, in no, in, at Harvard, yeah. And so that was the response on. And he, he mentioned that in his in his what's in it. But he also produced all these color charts as well, and they looked at different aspects of color. So. I mean, I think this is absolutely amazing how he's done all those, to, to these colour charts. And it was done with this glissure technique where he would um, use one colour and another colour and he'd keep on adding another layer of it and it would become more intense the more often he did. So this one here, he would have only done one layer and then he would have done this one, he did two layers and then three layers and four layers. So he would have continued. So he made all these charts. He also he also designed, you can still buy these at the bowl house today. He designed these spinning tops, right, for colours. He also made toys and also he designed um, children's things as well. Um, these are... Uh, this is the dollhouse, but it wasn't just an ordinary dollhouse. You, you know, you could move it around and make create it differently. So it had all these little pieces that you could make differently with it. And anyway, as a result of his knowledge on colour, he was asked to. Um, he was he got a position at 
It was again at the old building where the bow house had been. They had a new school, a, an architectural school, and he was asked to teach colour theory there. And you can see that um, here he is with the students. He's given out, he's got some of his, his um, charts there. You can see some of his charts. And the students have to work with them. And he also introduced them to this Paul Bowman uh, chart, you know, for decorating. So he looked at, at what colours were suitable for, for different places, right? So this is all with the colour theory. Anyway, and he, and he also designed furniture. And I think you know, some, we've all seen this, this steel furniture. Well, that, that all came out of the Bowhaus in that time, right? So there. And then after that, he got a position at teaching teachers at Frankfurt on, on order. And before he did that, he, he set about learning about that. He, he studied up on that. And he worked out what children could do at certain ages, what was suitable. And again, he had the other thing of, of using everyday materials, not just draw, sketching and drawing. He wanted the children to do other things. So you, you can see these are things he did with the, with the children. So he worked out new ways of doing it. He was very inventive. So, so that was that. So you can see um, age-appropriate activities. I mean, a girl and a half uh, purchasing uh, potatoes at the markets, that sort of thing, right? And then, and uh, to, to work with all these things, he used to get the people to go and collect, collect all the different materials, right? And so you can see them all labelled, and children can work different materials. So he want, this was part of material studies, so they understood what materials were capable of. They made these using dowel and cardboard, and then he also got them to design costumes for for plays so, as well. So this was all part of it. Again, this was in Frankfurt and Order, which is, but it's now on the Polish border, right? There's two Frankfurts in, in, in Germany. One, one is the Frankfurt on Main, where the main airport is, and the other one is Frankfurt Order, which is on just on the border, on the river Order, which, so, and, and again, what happened? Um, things, things got bad again. Um, what happened was we had the Wall Street crash and after the, uh, Germany had, uh, had the, the hyperinflation, the, the American banks started lending the German companies money, right? And then when the Wall Street crash happened, of course they wanted all their money's money back and so um, that the things started to go down. So he, he managed, still managed to get a job in northern Germany for a while, um, which was a different, wasn't a different um, area. And um, he worked there for a short time. But again, you had Hitler came to power. Once things got bad, you got the right-wing people coming into, into power. Well, you had six million people in, unemployed overnight when when the, the factories all closed. So things were really bad. Anyway, and that's his little daughter on, on the elephant. So that's some of the things they made. So what did he do? He decided he'd try to go, he went to Berlin. But this is where things started to get difficult with, it. with Hitler in power. His um, grandparents were both Jewish. And when the grandmother died, the, 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 they found the, the, the grandfather found a thing to say that he she wanted she was con conversing with the um, with the minister with the Christian minister, and so he decided he would become a Christian. And the, and his father was was considered a Christian, brought brought up a Christian, and of course he was brought up as a Christian. But this didn't matter. He was classified as a um, half Jew, right, which meant that he couldn't work because they, they, they sort of said, and his father, unfortunately, was, was classified as a full Jew, although he'd been brought up in the Christian religion. Anyway, um, so what did he do? He started thinking of some other way to get money together. So he gave private lessons in instrument making. So you can see... 
Um, these are the drums and and these are the kids working on these instruments. Right, so he did those. So they, he made those instruments and then he also even started working on the book that was supposed to go with, with the Orf, Carl Orff wrote a uh, school uh, book for school children, teach them. And so he actually was going to include that as part of the instrument making. So these are, these are, um, are whistles again and things. So this was all part of the, what he was going to do for, the, for this book. Anyway, so but things got really bad. I mean, he couldn't paint and, and everything, so he decided he would leave Germany. But um, what had happened is that um, some of his friends had already left because Walter Gorpius, the founder of the Bauhaus, found the, the restrictions of the Nazi regime too difficult, right? And... Um, and even so, some of the, the, the ones that weren't even Jewish had left because they didn't like the, the, the fact. And a lot of academics left, a lot of people left during that time. Anyway, but he and Albus had got a job in, in, in America and then later Gropius had got a job in America. And his wife, sister was also in America. So he thought this would be, this would be a good place. So he started... He went to England as a stepping stone. And in London, he came in contact with the Quakers because his, his father-in-law had met one of the Quakers, the Clarks, who were famous from the, for the um, Clark shoes in, uh, um, in Heidelberg. So, so he had this connection. And through this Quaker connection, he was given employment um, in, in Wales. I'm just going to get some water. So, and this was a Quaker a subsistence program where they decided to teach um, um, unemployed miners new trades, and he was put in charge of the woodwork. But this is typical of him. He went back to Germany and enrolled with, and started working with a carpenter. So you'll often see that he fled Germany, but he didn't really flee. He, he kept on going back, right? And so he taught, um, he taught them uh, skills and he also designed things that they could make and furniture that they can make. They made toys and things. So he worked with the, with the, with the miners. He also worked with... Um, with the area there, he taught, gave art lessons in the area as well. So this is here, he's working with the miners and he had designed this outdoor theatre. So this is one of the things he did, did with the miners. And then that actually finished after two years. So then he returned to London and then he started to look for some more work. And he, he found work at the Peckham Health Centre, which was sort of, it's a, for, for uh, people who weren't th that well off. It was a health centre. And he, he was started teaching uh, young boys how to make um, instruments, right? But then he found that the boys got very bored after making instruments. So he thought he'd had to work out a way that they could use some instruments. So he developed this thing called the coloured cord, right? And you can see at the top there's three... Three, uh, four colours, and he would have his, this this sort of machine, and he would he would sit there. He play, he was very musical. He played with with a what do you call a squeeze box? Yes, played a squeeze box, and then he um he, he would press a blue card. So they would have to turn it to the blue and strum the blue blue chords, right? And the aim was that. In time, the kids would get attuned for the music. They would know. They wouldn't even have to look at the colour the color indicator. This one's called the colour indicator, the last one. And they would understand which chords they had to play. So that was part of the thing. And it got quite a bit of publicity when, when Queen Mary visited the, the Peckham Health Centre. And so, and of course, you can see they called Mr Mac. So he called himself Mr Mac in in, in, in England rather than Hirschfeld, you know. So 
And these are some of the other things that he designed as well. All the instruments. So he was very big into instrument making. Anyway, again, things, things got, got difficult because in 39, um, he actually uh, received notice of the war broke out. And he'd received notice that he could start at, uh, um, in, he got a job with, with, at the same school as his friend Al was in America, which would have been Black, Black Mountain College. Anyway, but he, he went, was asked to go and help out at Durham College because the, the children of uh, the um, Clarks were at Durham College and uh, they had an evacuation camp during the war. And so here he is there with the, with the children, see him with his squeeze box mm -hmm. and the children and some of the instruments. And you can see the huts where the children were, were, were during the war. Well, that all came to an end um, because when, um, uh, yes, so I said he secured a job there, I've, I've already mentioned that, and in 19, because in 1940, he was captured and interned. And what had happened is, because uh, Germany advanced into France so quickly, they thought there might be, they call them fifth colonists, who were working with the, uh, who were working with the Germans and were, were um, helping them. So Churchill said, call of the lot. So he was then... He ended up at, on the Isle of Man. You can see that's a promenade at the Isle of Man, right? And uh, that, that, they housed them there for a while. And then he, he got the order to, you know, they got the order to be transported. And he actually um, thought one ship was leaving beforehand and he went down to, down to the docks and it was the and, and, and Andorra, Andorra Star which actually sunk, but he was the man before him was the last one on who, who so he had quite a little bit of luck there. Anyway, so he got on the Danira, the next ship, and they thought that because he thought he was going to go to Canada, because then it would have been a stepping stone to America. So he wouldn't he would have been and he could have maybe filled that position he had in America. But as it turned out, the, the Danira wasn't going to head for, wasn't heading for It was heading for Australia. So here I've got his service re record. Now, and you can see where he was. So from he arrived in Sydney, then he was transferred to Hay in, in, in northern New South Wales. And then he was transferred to Orange. And then he ended up in Tatura. And he was in Camp 2. And I wasn't, he wasn't in the same camp as I was. There was there were seven camps in Tatura, and I was in I was in Camp Three, and he was in Camp Two, right? So yes, so that's and then you can see released on parole, and when that happened, so this is his service record, and of course he did do some painting and he did some work in 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 Hay. He he taught the students as well, and he he produced a xylophone out of the timber. He did a lot of things like that. And, and the first thing they got when they got to, to Hay was, of course, they had those sandstorms. So this is one of his, uh, uh, the sandstorm is a monster, I quite like that. And this one brought back memories for me because what they did at, at the camps, they went and um, had the old army coats from World War I and they dyed them red so that, that if the people decided to escape, you could see them a mile off. And, but they were very useful. They were nice and warm. And the people didn't, you didn't have much because even at my parents, when they came, they only were allowed to have, have um, uh, how much, 20 kilos per, so there wasn't much. So they were very grateful for these, for these um, coats. And then, and this is where he produced the, the most famous of the woodcuts, which is called Desolation. This one's got a bit of colour in. There's ones, other ones that are black and white. So that's where... So, and from, from... This was in orange. 
then he got transferred uh, to to Tatura. And this was where he, he came, his visitors included the Quakers, because um, his daughter had also worked for the Quakers, so she was in contact with him. And that's where he met Olive Russell, who became his second wife. Um, he, he also was visited by Bard Bracey, who he'd had contact with uh, with this uh, Quaker subsistence program in Wales. And he knew James Darling, and that that uh, and Darling had lost a few a few teachers because of the war they'd gone off, so Darling responded and and hired him as as the art teachers. So this is so you can understand now he's had a very 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 full education. So when he comes to to Geelong Grammar, he's going to use all the things he's learned all the all this one time. So. And this is from the what's and there was an out, outburst of art in the art room. So they he introduced clay modeling, something they'd never done, pottery, wood, wood carving, sculpture, metalwork, leather work, book binding, and even making the musical instruments. So this is what the so the students who so it wasn't just drawing and, and painting, it was more than that. And they did practical things like Stage, stage productions. I produced the stage, uh, performing art, made puppet theatres. So this was and relief maps. He he um, started relief maps already in in um, in different places as well. So, and you can see these are some of the examples of the things that the students produced. Right. So you, the pottery. You can see the boy doing the relief map of Australia, so all of that. So these are the, these are examples. Then you had um, so this is this cupboard is still in, in at Geelong Grammar, isn't it? So yeah, so it's got some of the work that the children did in that stage, and I've taken that that one was um, Queen. Elizabeth with Francis Drake, knighting for. Then we've got Henry VIII. They also did a, the head of um, James Darling and things like that. So these are some of the things the students did at Geelong Grammar. And the other thing they did around the art room. Now these pictures were taken two years ago, and and if you think this was done in 19, what, 1942, 43. These pictures, the, the, the still holding. So he he had the he designed the layout in the art room, and then the children under the, his direction went and did the, the 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 painting. Right. So and and it's got the twelve. It goes right. It's got thirteen panels, I think, all together. So I've just chosen a few. So he put up scaffolding, and the the ch children were were busy doing an art school. The freeze, and it's still there today. And then he also got designed the art school gates, so you can see this theme again: people holding hands. And this is one of his students, Vix Wright. He taught him how to make these. These are three quarter of the size of the human size of this person. So you can see those two at the front of when you go to Long Grammar. This was one of his students that made made those under his direction. So they, I mean, it's quite amazing. And actually, Rick Wright went on to, he lived up at um, Bombala, and he, he, you can see some of his work. I think I saw some at Eden. He's done some work. He's continued on and did some more work in that, with, with, with that sort of thing. And they've been, I think they were cement and I think they've bronzed them now, haven't they? So, the, yes. And then he also had the kids produce a, 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 um, a path, a tiled path, which is probably one, you see a lot of them now, but I think this was probably one of the first one that was ever made. So they did all that, the, the students did that and designed all their own things. So that was that. He was, you know, he was also busy with the landscaping of the thing. And here's some of the pottery that the students made. So, 
and they also made the instruments. So, and they also designed, he, he helped with the design of the, the plays for the theatres. And anyway, short, what happened is that um, we had um, the, the Herald, it was the Fine Arts for the uh, University of Melbourne, and I uh, said, um, Joseph uh, Burke yeah, was was hired, and he he um, from from he found out about Ludwig very early and went down and visited him, and then he, Ludwig was asked to uh, to join the the standing committee at the University of Melbourne of Art, and um, and um, amongst the things he did advocate for was like at the Bowl House they had to produce some of their work to show that they were worthy of, of becoming a student. So, and I, before that, I think a lot of it was just a written exam on, on, on art. And so he wanted the student, he felt this, this uh, disadvantage, the, the students that were really good at, at art, but not very good at learning facts. So he was advocated that. And he was featured in the, um, in the age, and this is one of his, uh, that was featured with it, the, the nativity scene that he carved, right? So people started to find out about him. Go on. And then in 1954, he organised an exhibition of, of the work of the, the students. And uh, so it was from um, the junior school, Rostock House and Glamorgan. They all, the work that they did... And people were absolutely amazed. And they had 3,000 visitors. And then they even had to extend it because people had never seen anything like that. And then once he did that, there's some more things that were on display, right? And once he did that, the art teachers wanted him to go and help them. So he, this is where he started because the, um, the art teachers had been just formed, the Victorian art teachers had been, uh, had been just formed. And um, so, well, this is just examples of some of the students' work. And so then he, he was asked to conduct courses. So he conducted 10-week courses, uh, uh, you know, to, for art teachers. And what I found is he used some of his painting, his photos that he'd taken in Germany. And if you can see down the bottom there, he's got little labels on them. So he must have put those up as well to show the teachers the sort of things that students could do at certain ages. So he, he introduced them to a whole lot of things. Um, okay, and then, well, he, art, he wrote articles for the Art Teachers Association. He re re received press. If you go to the uh, archives in, in, in Melbourne, you'll see a lot of people asking him for advice on this and teachers asking for advice on that. He ran summer, summer, he ran summer courses at the National Gallery. He lectured at the CIE. He did colour theory and a lot of other things as well as, as that. So he was, and then he was asked, he lectured at the UNESCO conference. He, he made music with the disabled children in Geelong and Kew, which was quite amazing. He, he, t he decided he'd try his, his colour cord to see if they would work with the children. At, at, and it was Kew Cottages at that time where you had the disadvantages. And um, his, his uh, daughter wrote that one of the nurses, because he worked with them and they, they responded with the music. And uh, one of the, the, the nurses who had been there for years and years, she had tears in her eyes when she saw the way the children responded with the music. So, yes, yeah, so, and yes, yeah, so he did a lot. I mean, also he was involved with the, with the, the National Gallery. He knew Roy Grounds and everything because Gropius came out and visited and, of course, Roy Grounds was there. So he was, he was involved with the... With the um, National Gallery as well. And so now I've come to the conclusion. The, the reason I started doing this because I realised he was such a remarkable man and because I love art 
And I remember my art teacher coming back one time and we started to do different things. And I'm sure he went to one of his courses, right? And, um, and I've heard other people artists say, and um, it was amazing, you know, his versatility. But above all, because I've read, read a lot, a lot of letters, because I was very fortunate because the family supplied me with their memories, with the letters, all the letters he'd written to his daughter from, from camp, from, from to, you know, while he was interned, all the, all the letters he'd written from, from um, uh, Geelong Grammar to his sister, I've read all those, his, his wife, his first wife, put together a wonderful memory and then his, his sister had put together a wonderful memory. So all of these and, of course, then there was the archives in, in, in Melbourne University. Then there's, his letters are in, at, Har at Harvard because he wrote to Gropius. Then his letters are also at, at, at the Albers Institute in, 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 um, in, in America. And so you could see, and he was very much his humility really struck me that that he wasn't he wasn't try, trying to become famous. He just had this humility, and um, and absolute generosity. And and at the front of the book, is, he, I think I will put that quote in where he says he wants to help serve. He doesn't expect anything in return. So I thought that was one, and and I. When I worked with, I worked together with, with um, I met the family, and of course I met Chris Bell, the grandson, who has just recently passed away, and and that's been a really hard time, and who was say, who had that same wonderful, you know, generosity and all of that humility and all of that. I mean, he he don't he just donated. Um, uh, because they had an exhibition on at, at Orange, and he just donated that desolation, which is worth an awful lot of money. He donated that, but he didn't want that to be me. When he donated it, he did it behind the scenes. He didn't want the the, the thing. So he had that same humility and generosity. So anyway, so so that was my great honour. Okay, that's so. Has anybody got any questions? I'm fine. <laughs> So Chris Bell assisted you with the book? Yes. yes. He's provided me with so much information and, and everything. So, um, you know, it's so, uh, you know, his mother's, because the mother had kept the letters. She was at a boarding school and so she kept the letters that um, were written to her, he wrote to her while she was at boarding school. So I found out a lot of the things that, you know, he was doing. I mean, a lot of them were, were, were girlish things that, you know, weren't important, but there was a lot of things that I found out. And, yes, so, and, of course, she kept the letters, all the letters from, from uh, Tatura all his time in internment, he kept as well. So that was just made such a much, and Chris provided me with all of this information. And and as I said, the family overseas, I was lucky enough to meet the, the nieces, and and then the the granddaughter of um of his sister, and she provided me with a lot of these photos and everything, and and helped me. And so yes. It, it was a lovely journey. Yes, I how, how long did it take you to do that, to compose the book? A long, a long time, over a decade. Because there's clearly a lot of research. Yeah. It's all in, in Betty's head. Yeah. I'm just wondering what happened to his first wife. Oh, well, his first wife was, um, uh, uh, she had got developed after the birth of the third daughter. Right, that there's a the whole there's, there's some more to the story. There's, yeah. We've got a whole section on, on her I've written about. For, after the birth of his third daughter, she developed multiple sclerosis, right? And so it was very, he still had to support her all the time. And um, so, of course, he couldn't get a living in, in Germany, so that's why he went to England. And, and he was doing quite well in, in, in Wales. And sending quite a bit of money back, but that sort of died up. So, and then she didn't, 
she didn't really want to, she would have, I think, gone to America because she had a sister there, but she didn't want to leave Germany and she was, you know, she couldn't do it, she couldn't move. And she died in, in now I've forgotten what, in 1953, I think, so she died. Yeah, so he was, he was kind, there's a whole story where he tried to, to, he was stuck over here and he was trying to find out what, what was happening to his, his family. I mean, can you imagine he's, he's reading the paper here in Australia and he's seeing exactly what's happening in Germany and his, his, his other daughter was in England being bombed by the Germans and then the, the, the English were bombing. Yeah, so it's, it's quite amazing what he went through. And, and yes, so there's... Are there any other descendants in Australia? Well, the, the, um, the, the parent, the, 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 the eldest daughter, Marga, right, she, she came out, he brought her out, and that's how Chris was here. And then the, the next, then Chris was the youngest, there was two others, um, Anita, who went to England and met her husband, who was from Kenya, and decided to go to Kenya. But then, then Chris, then... Um, she had an ep epileptic fit and and died and then the the husband said well and then at that time Catherine the, the second one went over and he said oh it's usually custom that you go and marry the sister oh. so she ended up marrying marrying and so she's in Kenya <laughs> <laughs> so that's quite an amazing amazing family but but some of the grandchildren are uh are in, in um, and England. I think the, the, the two children of an, Anita, the, the, so there was Anita, Catherine, and then Chris, and they're in, in there. Uh, in, in, and I think one of the, the ch children of, of um, Anita is, and she's married to Clark, I think. So, oh. <laughs> so yes, so that's. Yeah. <laughs> Oh yes, I could have shown you. I mean, and I, and I actually, I had a different one. I don't know which one I had. I also had some of his artwork on on another one, another thing. And I, I was surprised because I thought I'd send you the latest, but I mustn't have. And um, he had um, he did a lot of artwork. He did. Um, <laughs> Oh, prolific amount of artwork, and he actually invented little um, things. He invented. Now, if I get the book, can I get the book and show? Is, is he? Does he have his artwork, or or other things that he has done? Or items, or music, or instruments in any of our galleries? Yes, yes, it's got all that. His his, his artwork is in in all the the. the um, the galleries in, in National Gallery of Victoria, you can go and see it. Um, the National Gallery of Australia, Geelong Gallery, Ballarat Gallery, uh, there's one in Bendigo, uh, what else? Where, even Albury's got one, Newcastle have got quite a lot, Queensland have got quite a lot. So it's all in the back of the book where, where all his artwork are, artworks are. And now, of course, Orange has got some. <laughs> so, um, and you can see, uh, well, he invented this method of, um, let's have a look. It was called a Deutschzeit Zeichen, and I, 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 I thought I had an, another, oh, so I was surprised when I saw what was uh, was on there because I, I had actually done another one. I must have somehow got mixed up. But he, he invented a, a method where he would um, get a piece of paper and he would um, draw on the back of it a, a, a sketch, right? But it's, uh, then he'd put that, he'd get a, a um, glass with ink on it or paint and he would... Um, and then uh, put that the, the piece of paper on there and draw around it, and that would leave it a dent, and that would be called a monoprint, right? And then he would set about leaving it, and then he would do all these uh, sort of different. Uh, where were? I? Well, you can see here. There's some, that's that's one of these. These um, I'll come closer. 
these molar prints. And remember I talked about the Glossaw technique. So he would start off here and he would do one layer of blue. And then this, then the next one he would do, that would have two layers. And then he would do another one where he'd have three layers and then four layers and then five layers. And then in the process, you can see the, the darkness. And so, and so he, before he did this, this would have been, this piece of paper would have been face down on the glass. He would have drawn those, those heavy lines in black and all of this in black to get the ink. And then he would do the, and then he started to experiment a bit more, right? With, he used different combs and things. So, and then he also invented here in Australia, and actually Claire asked if he can borrow this method. He bought, he bought. Mm -hmm. And then this one here is called the calcimine, where he, again, got a, a it could even be, just have been cardboard or anything. He painted it blue. And then he got this, um, what would you call it? It was like um, what they do plastering with, you know, plaster, this white stuff. It, 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 yeah, cal calcimine, calcimine. Yeah, and they would get that. And so um, he would put that on while it was wet and then he would scratch the things into it, right? And the blue would come through and then he would leave it to dry and then he used watercolour on top of that and then he would put a lacquer on and you'd think it was done done with oil. So it was a very cheap. And so this, he had the students experimenting in all different ways of doing things that, that, you know, they could do. I think they did something with putting shellac on things and then they would do. So the students started to experiment as well. Yes. So anyway. I wish I had such a creative art teacher when I was in the Yes, well, well, but it was also amazing that um, that, the, that the students who weren't good at art, you know, they 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 thrived because they, well, I mean, the, the students made those um, those figures in the forge of the, the of the um, uh, of the yes of the gates, yes, so mediums too, students yes. found something. That, that oh, wow, yeah, because that was part of uh, material studies and I actually had, I don't know what why, I, I must have sent you the wrong one because I had um, the students also doing, you know, experiments with designing, I mean, like with paper, see who, which could hold the weight, mm -hmm. how they could bend the paper to the whole weight and, and things like that and... Um, Yes, so I don't know anyway. So something went wrong, but it doesn't matter. We, we got through it. Yes. Thank you. Oh, Have you got a question? Yes. Ludwig have been, been friends with other people on the Denera? Yes, he would have. Um, yes. Yeah, I'll, I'll come back here. Yes, he was friends. And um, he had one was particularly, now I've forgotten his name. Um, he, he was into, uh, into plants and he, he uh, so he had quite a few friends and then uh, quite from, by accident I met this, this Christian Otto who, whose grandfather was also great friends with him so, so, and, and so he, he's actually mentioned 